We're exploring the Marvel Comics interconnected half million page story through author Douglas Wolk's guide to the past 60 years of American culture in his new epic book, All of the Marvels. Thinking of it as a single story that has been going on for 27,000 comics for 60 years and is still growing. And what does that story look like? What does that story mean? What does that story say? We're digging deep into the art direction of evolving characters, the printing and reprinting process, and into the ever-changing plot twists. This for me, like I was, I was geeking out full force right. for comics like this because it's, it's such actually a fascinating description. Is Doctor Doom really a villain? The answer may just surprise you. We'll find out more about the Marvel Universe with host Ben Saunders, University of Oregon's professor and director of comics and cartoon studies minor, for an entertaining one-on-one -on -one conversation with critic and author Douglas Wolk. Douglas Wall, author of all of the Marvels. I first just want to begin by saying how much I've enjoyed reading this book. I think it is. Thank you so much. It's terrific. I think it's funny. It's insightful. It's um, uh, it attempts something almost superhuman itself in terms of the basic undertaking of the project to read pretty much every superhero Marvel comic between um, the early 1960s and uh, 2017, I think was your cutoff point nominal uh, cutoff point i actually kind of kept reading after that but i know yeah. i know <laughs> I, 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 well i guess you know once you've started um it made me want to go back to the 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 comics and that's the highest critical compliment i think i can pay to the highest compliment i can pay to a critic is that i would want to go back to the source yeah. material so um the book is is a tremendous success on all, on all of those levels and quite early on on page 20 um, you say what this book is not. You say it is not a book about the comics form in general. You say that it is not an argument that all the comics that you looked at are good, although some of them are. You say it's not a defense of Marvel's business practices currently or historically. It's not a defense of the comics retrograde, retrograde myopic history of representation. It actively disavows the elements of mainstream comics readership that try to keep it to the province of straight white men. You know, it's sort of an extended list of, of um, and I particularly like the last one, actually. It is absolutely not an argument that reading all of Marvel's comics is an ideal or even an advisable way to approach them, um, which is a, a, you know, it's sort of an auto-destructive moment of your, of yes. your project. <laughs> so, so what's your eleva elevator pitch for what this book is in that case? I guess my elevator pitch is that I wanted to see what this half million page story that's been published over the last 60 years looks like as a story, mm -hmm. as a single, maybe not quite totally unified, but pretty much unified narrative, and the way it reflects the culture around it over the last 60 years in bizarre ways. But just thinking of it as a single story that has been going on for 27,000 comics for 60 years and is still growing. And what does that story look like? What does that story mean? What does that story say? Did this project start out as one kind of thing and end up becoming something else? Or do you have a sense of it as, as changing in the process of you reading into it, this vast story? It definitely evolved. Uh, it was written a couple of times. I wrote a version of it that wrote it beginning to end and it just did not work it was me talking to myself it was me living in my head and i realized that it had to have a lot more outreach in it and i realized that what i could do was be a sort of tour guide mm -hmm. could be somebody who says okay here is a territory that i have covered every inch of but you don't want to cover every inch of it you want to see what parts you would be interested in. Let me be your guide. Let me show you around so you can see what the possibilities of this thing are. And that's what it ended up being. And I'm much happier with that, I think. Your answer leads me to another question, which is, so your book is in some ways predicated upon the 
appeal of the idea of the Marvel universe, at least the comic book universe, as one vast story, as one interconnected story. And you suggest that there, part of the pleasure can be the um, following different threads of this, of this interconnected narrative web. But I think there's an, actually also an interesting tension then in the book between these pleasures, um, which are not narrative. And actually one of the things that you also say is that you don't want to suggest that people should read this narrative chronologically. The, the, the image that you use at one point is that of grazing. You yes. come to this book and you sort of graze a little here and you, you move over here, which is, so I think I feel, I felt like that sort of exists a little, in a little bit of tension with the idea that this is one big vast interconnected story, but it's also a story that you don't want to start at the beginning and then try to, to, to read through to, to the end. You so, absolutely don't know. <laughs> so there are two questions here. One is, so what kind of narrative is it if it's a narrative that you absolutely don't want to start at the, at the beginning with? And second, what are the other pleasures that come up? Um, and I think they do come up in your writing. Um, certain pleasures of style, pleasures in the visual. What are the other, what are the non-narrative pleasures of reading all of the Marvels? So those are both excellent questions and, and they're very different to, to address the one of, you know, what kind of narrative is it if it's not a start to finish narrative? If you're used to reading conventional narrative, you know, prose narrative or poetic or, you know, filmic or whatever else, those are very much like point A to point Z kinds of things. You start at the beginning, you go on until you reach the end, then stop. And that's not how the Marvel story works. The Marvel story extends in all kinds of dimensions. It is always adding events before the beginning. It is always adding things into things that you've already seen. You can go into the story at any point and there will be history that you've missed. And that's fine. <laughs> there is there is a pleasure to not knowing and then finding out. You, know, you see something, something's like, oh, what is that name? What does that mean? They're clearly referring to something that happened before. I don't understand, but I'm going to keep that in my memory. And maybe at some point when you go back to read something that was published five or 10 or 30 years earlier, you'll see a moment that makes you go, oh, now I get it. That, that's a different kind of narrative from things that have a linear kind of construction. Mm -hmm. But I think it's something that's really special about this kind of enormous, enormous story. Mm -hmm. There's also, you know, the thing about the enormous story is that there's this sense of history that has been building up for 60 years or more. There's a prehistory. There's you know, 20 plus years of comics before the beginning, the quote, beginning of the story. But it's always there. Its weight is always there, even if it's not being directly referred to. But you just said something else that I wanted to ask you about, which is, of course, you're, you're starting, um, for all intents and purposes, you decide that the Marvel Universe begins with, the, with Fantastic Four number one. But you just mentioned, of course, there is that prehistory mm -hmm. um, and that it's incorporated into the Marvel Universe, as you, of course, know, um, in Fantastic Four number four with the reintroduction of the Submariner um, and so really early on in Stan and Jack's career, there's this decision to make the single narrative that they're working on part of this vaster prior narrative, which you absolutely don't have to have read, but that sort of being aware of its existence is important. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, you know, I mean, maybe even in the specifics, why is it the Submariner, for example, that, that they do they do that with and, and um, and maybe say a bit more about your decision to start where you start. I mean, it, it is the Submariner, but it's also the Human Torch. Like right. the Human Torch who shows up in Fantastic Four number one. It's a different Human Torch from the one who had appeared in comics in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Right. But it's the Human Torch. And it doesn't right. mention that. For, it takes a while to get around to that because two right. Human Torches, how are we going to explain that? Uh, in one sense, it's, you know, intellectual property, let's revive the thing we've got because the Marvel story has always been driven by business. Right. It's always been driven by commercial concerns. It's always been driven by capitalist concerns. That's one of the, that is one of the weights it's ca that it carries. That is also one of the things that pulls it along. Uh, 
uh, which is the cart and which is the horse tends to shift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, sure, art and commerce. I mean, this is actually a big part of the relationship between art and commerce is one of the reasons that the Marvel story is totally worth thinking about. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you know, there are these tools that are available to Lee and Kirby when they start making their story. And one of them is, here's the Submariner and where has he been? Right. He's somebody from the past. What happened in the meantime? Why haven't we been seeing him? And right. you can, ha having that character be somebody who actually did appear in the past, who might be in the memory of the kids who are picking this Tencent comic off, right. off the newsstand and might not, that's really interesting. Yeah. Maybe some of the people picking it up were like young Roy Thomas, who I think wrote a letter about that issue that was printed a few issues later, right. like somebody who had uh, said, oh, there's the Submariner again, right. and this is this is this thing from the past that's, that's returned. That's really interesting to me. Yeah, I think it's fascinating too. I also think that that character is one of the characters that you could, who would be most at home in the new comic book universe that Lee and Kirby are starting to invent with and with Ditko as well. These heroes who are uncomfortable with the role of being heroes, heroes who are also heroes who have feet of clay, heroes who maybe have some kind of monstrous uh, capacity to them even. Submariner is one of the few characters from the 1940s who you can drop unchanged into that universe. And he works perfectly because he's always kind of a jerk. He's always um, kind of a jerk and he's always got his own agenda, which is not, it's, sometimes it lines up with a quote, heroic agenda. Sometimes it lines up with an Americanist agenda. And sometimes it really, really doesn't. And that kind of ambiguity is, it's a lot of fun. And it's a thing that the Marvel story has always had fun playing with. The reason why we think of the story as starting in 1961 is that that is the point where Lee and Kirby and Ditko and a few others a little later reintroduced the idea of superhero characters, which had been out of fashion for a while. Like it had got, you know, Captain America becomes Captain America's weird tales and then becomes a horror comic and then dies. And then he gets revived in the mid fifties as Captain America commie smasher, which doesn't quite catch on. They, you know, they try, but superhero comics 1961 are pretty much dead aside from, you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, like what, what national slash DC is publishing at that point. It's taking a flyer. It's kind of going out on a limb. And the second superhero title that uh, the new, the, the company that is not even yet called Marvel, it is just Martin Goodman's publishing company that has an MC logo that might have stood for Marvel Comics, but nobody's really sure whether it did or not on its cover. The second one they do is the Hulk. And that's not a superhero comic. That's a monster comic with a recurring protagonist. At the same time, I have a little thing in the book about how like, oh, you know, my actual starting point, it's not Fantastic Four, number one. Let's go back two months earlier to Linda Carter, student nurse. Right, right. Linda Carter, student nurse is by the writer Stanley and artist Al Hartley. It is not a good comic. Mm -hmm. It lasts nine issues. But at the time, the company that would become Marvel is publishing a bunch of comics about teenage girls and young professional women. Mm -hmm. Like they publish their monster comics and they publish their like comics about young women. And there's you know, Millie the Model and Modeling with Millie and Patsy and Heidi and Patsy Walker and Kathy the Teenage Tornado. And mm -hmm. these characters all meet each other two months after Fantastic Four number one. There's a little crossover right. between them. Right. Like before we have superhero characters meeting each right. other, this happens yeah. and they never go away entirely. And that's, that's a fascinating strain. Yeah. I'd say it's almost like, you know, Stan could never throw an idea away. You know? <laughs> um, and, but there's also, uh, but it, this is very much the pleasure of narrative continuity that you're yeah. unpicking here and seeing that this is in a way part of the, uh, of the imagination of the editor in chief at the company, certainly from very early on, the idea that you could take these various properties that are siloed in their different magazines, and actually that it's more fun when you bring them together, or that there is something fun about bringing them together. I really want you to say a bit more about some of the other things that 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 drive your own pleasure as a reader um, 
when you're looking at these books, particularly perhaps maybe the older books, what, it, what are the, the non-narrative joys of, of all of the Marvels? There are so many, and that's a, that is a lovely question. One of them is the way that they reflect their historical moment. Mm -hmm. Lee and Kirby and their collaborators were constantly throwing in references to, the, to their moment. What they were doing was always also informed by their moment. The monster stories, the Hulk stories, like those are those are not just like we're scared of atomic weapons those are the testing moratorium on atomic weapons has just ended and now things are really different from how they were four months ago and we're going to do a story about that uh -huh. you keep seeing public figures turn up in them sometimes it's you know jfk sometimes it's the beatles yeah um, and you know in the 60s it's mostly like fairly respectful like you know we're 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 showing this person who is important to underscore the importance of what's going on in the story. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you get Nixon and the claws come out and it's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Sure. Yeah. Uh, there's another totally different kind of pleasure, which is looking at a particular creator's idiolect, mm -hmm. seeing the particular way that specific artists draw things, specific mm -hmm. writers write things. Mm -hmm. you, you see you know, five lines of somebody's work and you know who it, it is. Right. You see somebody like Sal Buscema, who I thought of for ages as like the kind of gitter done professional who was drawing like a third of the Marvel line in the seventies. He could draw five comics a month yeah. and always thought of him like he just draws these real simple blocky characters. And I never thought much of him until I read everything he'd ever drawn and realize, number one, he's an absolutely flat out incredible storyteller. He is not flashy at all. He shows you everything you need to see. He leads mm -hmm. the eye exactly where it needs to go. Number two, if you pair him up with an inker, somebody who is willing to impose their own style on his work, Bill Sienkiewicz inks him for a while. Yeah. In the early 90s on Spectacular Spider-Man. And suddenly, Sal Buscema's work comes to life. Mm -hmm. It has so much character and presence and verve in it. It just needs a collaborator who knows how to make it work. That was a particular nice pairing because Sal also loved what Sienkiewicz was doing in his own books and had, I think, been was responding in a way to, to what people like Sienkiewicz had done to make comics more abstract. I also, I would say the same about someone like Klaus Janssen on Sal in the seventies as well. Klaus yeah. really can, can make um, Sal Buscema's stuff sing. You, you know, I just think what pops up into your mind after, after reading that many comic books. Uh, I'm going to alter that question say the cover of the Kamala Khan Ms. Marvel number one is uh -huh. the best cover of a first issue I think I've ever seen. And say say more. Say why. So, it is it is an image of a young woman. You can just see the bottom of her face and her torso, mm -hmm. and she's got textbooks in her hand. Mm -hmm. She has rings, decorative jewelry on her finger, and she's wearing a shirt with a logo on it. And it looks at first glance like it is an image of a superhero. It is not. She is not a superhero yet in that image. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is who Kamala Khan is. You are seeing signs of you know, that she is a student, that being a student is very important to her. The specific subjects that she's studying, you can see like the, the titles of the book she's got. Right. Her outfit that looks like it is a superhero outfit is not. It is a t-shirt with the logo of the heroine whom she idolizes mm -hmm. and a scarf that suggests the cape that she is going to be wearing later on when she's a superhero. You can see that her skin is brown, mm -hmm. which is an important thing about her. She is a Pakistani American. Uh, she's Muslim. She's carrying a, a book on Hadith. Yeah. Uh, and it just, it, there's something about her pose that's like, she's preparing for something that is about to happen. It mm -hmm. says so much about her in one image and it's not even the superhero picture. Best final issue. I love that final issue of Squirrel Girl. I, uh -huh. I you know, I wrote about it in the book. Uh, yeah, no, it, yes, and you talk about it, it moved you to tears. Yeah, yeah it yeah. wraps up everything about the story. It positions her for the next thing it has. Mm -hmm hysterically funny moments mm -hmm. like galactus shows up as her friend to mm -hmm. fix everything 
and which is a joke that has been set up from the very very beginning of the series it's right. all this stuff that ryan north and erica henderson and derek charm have set up for five years worth of comics and it all just pays off here's one where i think i might know what your answer will be but i'm going to ask it anyway okay. best marvel villain best marvel villain Ooh. um so the answer you're expecting me to, to say is dr doom of course uh, yeah uh, of course, uh, Doctor Doom is actually Marvel's greatest hero. Big difference. Uh, <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> so that you're going to have to explain too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I host a weekly podcast on which Ben has appeared, called The Voice of Latveria, which is formally it is a uh, Cold War era shortwave radio propaganda broadcast from Latveria, which is the tiny Eastern European state that the Marvel quote villain and quote Dr. Doom rules. Uh, more actually, it is conversations with a different person every week about a different comic story involving Dr. Doom. The interesting thing about Doom is that he's mostly only a villain because we keep being told that he's a villain. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he has his own agenda. It is a fairly ruthless and sometimes murderous agenda. He's unbelievably egotistical he's brutal he's awful and he has an end game in mind which is not really at all villainous mm -hmm. in its way mm -hmm. uh, and you know he does save everything at least one twice three mm -hmm. times maybe yeah you know so there's that best marvel villain um <laughs> uh I'm going to cheat once again and kind of pick a hero. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to say Emma Frost. Oh, nice choice. Yeah, yeah. Emma Frost, the White Queen from the Hellfire Club from uh, X-Men stories, mm -hmm. who has been up, you know, she's been playing on the good guys team longer by far than she was characterized as a straight up antagonist. And even so, like, she's awful. Mm -hmm. Like, she's she has a cruel streak that nothing can pull out of her mm -hmm. and again that's fascinating to get back into sort of some of the detail of, of your book i think my two personal favorite chapters were the ones uh, the one on the x-men simply because that's um that's an extraordinary synthesis that you perform on what is notoriously one of the most um baggy and uh, multiple and uh, uh, you know it, it's one of the hardest franchises within the larger marvel universe to really talk about coherently and your chapter remarkably pulls it off and manages to explain to some degree i think why the x-men can can still matter but the the surprise chapter for me was the one on the master of kung fu yeah. um partly because it's not to a lot of people's minds an obvious choice to focus an entire chapter on given the range of, of series that you could be working with um, but also because I, I, I agree with you that it is a, um, a little gem, a little bit of a lost gem, that, that original run. It's, a, it's one of my favorite 1970s comic books. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the argument of that chapter and, um, and why, despite some of the problematic aspects of that series, you think it's worth the effort. Master of Kung Fu both got visited by the Suck Fairy and by the Joy Fairy. Right. Like going back and rereading it, I would just every few pages, I would think this is so good. Mm -hmm. This is so much better than I realized it was when I was reading it as, you know, like a 12 year old or whatever. Uh, also, oh, my God, this is so problematic. Like, mm -hmm. how am I going to explain this to people? Mm -hmm. uh, it ran for some, a little over 10 years, something like that. Uh, yeah. which is a long yeah yeah it, it's a that's a long time for a series to survive mm -hmm. it was incredibly smart it had a few long runs by artists who were really really exceptional it had one writer doug mench who wrote pretty much the entire thing uh, and then it disappeared for 35 years and when I started writing the chapters, like there will never be a Master of Kung Fu movie. Now there's a Shang-Chi movie in theaters right now mm -hmm. as we speak. Shang-Chi being the main character from Master of Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. 
the racial politics of that comic, as it originally appeared, are super problematic. Fu mm. Manchu is a major recurring character, literally. Mm. Like, he is he is the character's father. Right. What do you do with that? Well, if you're reading it in the 1970s, and you recognize that this is a smart, interesting comic that has a big, big, big problem, you write a letter to the comic itself. Mm -hmm. And Mastro Kung Fu printed reader's correspondence, calling it out directly. And it had repeat correspondence. I actually mm -hmm. interviewed uh, one guy, William Wu, who was had his letters printed more than I wanted to ask you. I've yeah, always yeah. wanted to meet Bill Wu because I loved his yeah. letters. And I thought what was going on in the letter columns of that comic, I, I cannot think of another popular medium. And this is another reason really why comics are so important and indeed i can't think of i can't imagine this particularly happening in a dc comic of that era they respond to them in print and they respond to them in terms of what they're doing in the comic itself mm -hmm. slowly but they do and you get to see that dialogue happening on the page in the comic itself we're, we are both fans we're both sort of going deep into the long box here but the arrangement of the book on the page actually seems to have sort of a two, two readers in mind because you use footnotes a lot more than you have done yeah. in other work of yours that I've read. And in fact, I was really struck by your mastery of sort of the extended discursive footnote. And there are moments um, in the X-Men chapter, for example, where it's in the footnotes that you make these very detailed observation about certain stylistic ticks within Claremont's run things like, you know, the prevalence of the s &M imagery, you know, that's sort of a footnote observation. Or um, on page, uh, let's see, it's quite late, page 266, you have a long footnote. I mean, this is just to give people a sense of how it looks on the page, right? This, this, this really dense footnote where you compare the different coloring of one of your favorite Steve Ditko, Dr. Strange pages across about four or five different reprinted versions. And this for me, like I was, I was geeking out full force right. at moments like this, because it's, it's such actually a fascinating description of, it's a reminder that there isn't, there aren't even rules about how the reprints of this material is going to look. It had one set of colors when it first appeared, and then it has a different set of colors. Um, and we don't know what Ditko himself might have intended. Uh, and I want more of that, right? That's the stuff that really <laughs> sort of, you know, tickles my brain. Those, those really sort of deep minutia oriented readings of the material that also remind us, uh, raise interesting questions about um, how we want this material preserved, how we would like it best presented to us. Um, so, was that how did you have a sort of a logic as to this is a footnote point this is a main text point how how does the logic of the footnote emerge in your for you uh, compositionally uh the footnotes were, were more or less intuitive uh how how i use them and, and sometimes i just use them as punchlines or as jokes essentially if something was something i felt like saying but would derail what I was trying to get at in the main body of the thing, then down to the footnote it went. Mm -hmm. uh, the footnotes are there for people who want them to be. I, I tried to make it as friendly to different kinds of readers as I could, and mm -hmm. mostly making it friendly to people who did want a guided tour, uh, who were not terribly familiar with the territory, but also making sure that it would not get boring for people who were a little more familiar with the territory. And so that, mm. that, that kind of split worked out that way, I think. I also think that there's some very rich interpretive material there where you, where you let yourself, where you let your inner um, nerd really let go um, uh, and get right down into, into the weeds of things. One of the pleasures of all of the novels as I was reading it is thinking, you know, this is just the beginning actually of, of a, um, a project uh, of any number of books. This, this, I hope, is a book that actually inspires other books. Not only is it possible to find uh, something to enjoy in almost any Marvel book, but there is plenty to enjoy in all of the Marvels. And you can pick up uh, signed copies, I believe, at Left Bank Books. Douglas, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's thank you so much, man. This is great.